Sean Williams and Shane Dix first met when they were both writing short stories for Australian fanzines. And by February 2003, they had collaborated on over six books together. Williams would write the first draft, Dix would edit it, and then Williams would do the final polish of the text. Their last collaborative novel was released in 2006. Williams is still actively writing, but Dix doesn't appear to have any online presence. Fourth Heretic Remnant made it to number 10 on the New York Times paperback bestseller list for the week of February 23rd, 2003, and was ultimately on the list for two weeks. I have a confession to make. I did not finish the Force Heretic trilogy the first go around, and in rereading Remnant, I'm not even sure I finished this one. I read Destiny's Way in 2002, but I somehow managed to miss most or all of the 2003 paperback releases. So, a brief summary. The Galactic Alliance has risen from the ashes of the New Republic. But first, the Yuzun Vong must be defeated. While Han Solo and Leia Organa head off on a mission to investigate communication outages in the Kurnacht Cluster, Luke Skywalker and other Jedi head off in search of Zonama Seacoat, the mythical living world. But their journey has barely begun when they stumble upon the Imperial Remnant under attack by the Yuzun Vong. In Remnant, we see our heroes split up, quite literally. There are three main subplots that we follow through the story, and they are Han and Leia, and Jaina and Jag, and Tahiri's mission to Galantos to investigate what's happening with the Kornacht Cluster and what exactly the Yevatha have been up to. We have Luke Skywalker, Mara Jade, Jason Solo, Danny Kui, Seba Sabatine, and the Jedi healer Tekli heading off in search of Zonama Seacoat. They'll know they need to go to the Unknown Regions, they'll have to ask the Chiss for help, but for now they're going to check in on the Imperial Remnant and see what's happening. And our third subplot has to deal with Naminor and how he ingratiates himself into a Shamed One's community on the new Yuzen Tar. If I were to compare Han and Leia's mission with Luke and Mara's mission, Luke and Mara's mission feels a lot more important. Han and Leia, it just seems to be tying up some loose ends from the Bantam era books which is fine, it just didn't have the same important impetus that the other plotline had. Jaina and Jag and the Twin Sun Squadron are assigned to accompany Han and Leia on this mission. Jaina's rather ticked about it because she thinks that it's a way to take her out of active duty, and in a way it is. Jaina hasn't really had a chance to decompress and <laughs> wind down after everything she's gone through, so on the surface this mission with her parents looks like it will be a much calmer expedition. They're also accompanied by Tahiri Vela, who is not doing well at all. Tahiri has gone through so much in these books, between being captured by the Yuzun Vong, being shaped by the Yuzun Vong, losing Anakin, and you can see the toll that it's really starting to take on her here. There are a number of scenes in Tahiri's mindscape where Tahiri is running from something that has her own face, that has the name of Rena which if we think back to Edge of Victory Conquest, was the false identity that they were trying to implant in her memory, that rather than the Jedi Tahiri Vela, that she was a Yuzen Vong named Rena Quad. Tahiri's running from Rena, trying not to let her catch her, and at the same time, Rena is being chased by some strange, scary reptilian figure as well. 
Han and Leia bring Tahiri along to keep an eye on her. She has several relapses in this book, and it will be interesting to see what happens with Tahiri in the next two books of the trilogy, and if she's going to be able to reconcile this other part of herself that right now she doesn't want to acknowledge. Jag is rather suspicious of Tahiri. He's not sure of her motives, and so there's several situations where he accompanies Han and Leia specifically so he can keep an eye on her. But at the same time, it also seems that he is welcoming this opportunity to just hang out with his girlfriend for a bit. And as we've seen in the past few books, Han and Leia's relationship has really improved and grown to the point that there's one seed where they're arguing with each other, but it's not malicious. You could tell the deep feelings they have for each other, and that to a certain extent, arguing with each other is just how their relationship plays out at this point, that it's something they enjoy doing. Over on the Jedi mission, we have Luke, who has this very strong feeling that Zonama Seacoat is going to be the key to solving this conflict with the Yuzen Valm. He doesn't tell the Chief of State where he's heading other than it's very important, they'll check in on the Imperial Remnant and the Chiss along the way, but this is something right now that he has to do. He's accompanied by Mara, who's mostly here to fly the ship. It is her ship, the Jade Shadow after all, so I wouldn't expect her to allow anyone else to fly it. They need a healer. Silgal is otherwise occupied, so they bring along Techly. They bring along Danny Kui, the scientist who at this point perhaps knows the most about the Yuz and Vong, and is also very interested in a mission to find Zonama Seacoat, even if she's rather dubious that it even exists. Jason Solo is here, trying to figure out the role that he wants to play within the Jedi Order, and also trying to figure out his feelings for Danny Kui. There definitely was some romantic tension between them when they first met in Vector Prime, but that's definitely fallen by the wayside in the subsequent books. So it's interesting to see it come back in play here, especially now that Jason has matured so much and grown so much that the age gap between them doesn't feel quite so stark. And the final member of this Jedi mission is Saba Sebatine. The book opens with a prologue which shows Saba returning to her homeworld of Barab 1, only to find it's been devastated by the Yuzen Vong. A few Yuzen Vong ships appear, she takes out her anger on them, only to realize that one of them was a slave ship containing all that remained of her people. Saba's devastated by this. Saba does not think that she should be a member of this mission, that they need someone else, someone in a better mind place, someone who has not just suffered such great loss. But Luke insists, Saba comes along, and Saba is an integral part of this team. The final climactic rescue of the Imperials aboard another slave ship solely comes down to Saba, what she's willing to risk and what she's willing to accomplish in the end. And then we have Naminor. Naminor is always an interesting fellow because he doesn't ascribe to this very stark viewpoint that pretty much all the other Yuz and Vuln have. Naminor doesn't believe in their religion, he doesn't believe in their politics, he just believes in Naminor, what's good for him, what he can accomplish, and he's willing to backstab anyone and everyone to get what he wants. After the end of Destiny's Way, where he knew he was going to be held accountable for the trap that killed Savon Law and his forces, he retreated into the depths of the old Coruscant, now using Tar. When we run into him again in the beginning of Remnant, he's not doing well for himself, has mostly been subsisting off of granite slugs, runs into a shamed one and ends up being taken into their community, where he first gets a really good look at the Jedi heresy. 
It's interesting to me how it sprang out of Anakin's actions on Yavin 4, and also the fact that there are all these differing stories because it survived through word of mouth, shamed ones telling other shamed ones telling other shamed ones. And at this point, it's several years later, and it's just gone through multiple rounds of telephone. The shamed ones that Nominor lives with are betrayed, not because of the Jedi heresy, but because they were stealing stuff and got caught. And so his plotline ends with Nominor deciding he's going to take a new name, he's going to further root out this Jedi heresy in hopes that it will get him back in Supreme Overlord Shimra's good graces. So he takes the name of Yu Sha the Prophet. But he's really the only Yuzenvalln that we encounter here. There are obviously Yuzenvalln fighting the Imperials, and a few Yuzenvalln involved in the plot that Han and Leia uncover. But Nominor is our main focus here. Not Onami, not Shimra, not any of the other Yuzenvalln we've met thus far, but Nominor, that sneaky little weasel. Han and Leia's mission is to the planet Galantos because they haven't had any communications from them and they're really close to the Kornact Cluster where, in the Black Fleet Crisis, we last left the Yevitha after their fleet was destroyed. The Fia on Galantos are not very communicative. Jaina and two of the Chiss pilots head out to investigate what's going on with the Yevitha, and they find that they have been absolutely, completely destroyed. The Fia came to an agreement with the Yuzenvald that they will side with them if they defeat their enemy, and they did. The Yevitha are completely wiped out. Which I guess makes sense. The Yevitha's mindset is very similar to the Yuzenvald in that they don't like anyone who's not themselves, they're uber-violent, and I don't see the Yuzenvald allowing someone like that to live on in their galaxy, but it is a little bittersweet to find out their fate after it happened. Meanwhile, in the Imperial Remnant, Luke and co. stumble upon the Imperial Remnant's capital of Bastion being attacked by the Yuzen Valm. They help Admiral Pelayan, which, side note, multiple people here call him by his first name, Gilad, and that just felt rude to me, like, this is the Grand Admiral of the Imperial Remnant. Show him some respect and call him Admiral Pelay and do not call him by his first name, especially Jason calling him by his first name. Like, I don't know if this is meant to show us, like, they're Jedi and they don't follow the same rules that other people do, but it just felt discourteous to me. Pelayan accepts help from Luke, they retreat to Yaga Minor, only for Pelayan to be grievously wounded. He's only saved through the help of Tekli. And so Jason spends a lot of the time there trying to negotiate and talk to the Moff in charge of Yaga Minor. I thought this was interesting here. It definitely showed what Jason has picked up from his mother, even if I wasn't always sure why Jason was being appointed spokesperson instead of Luke or Mara or Saba, just someone with more seniority. As I said previously, they're able to rescue a slave ship, they're able to defeat the Yuzen Vuln fleet. Luke leaves them with some very good information. Pelayan pledges that they are going to help and side with the Galactic Alliance going forward. And Luke and co. leave for the Chiss now. So I guess book two will be them on the Chiss homeworld of Scylla, I think it is. So on a format stylistic front, Williams and Dix made a very interesting choice here, which was that the book is structured into a prologue, four parts, and then an epilogue. But within those four parts, there are no chapters. There's just scene breaks. This isn't entirely new to me. I have read a number of Terry Pratchett books, and Terry often writes sans chapters. And 
foregoing chapters isn't even the oddest stylistic quirk out there, I am looking at you, Cormac McCarthy, and your dislike of loads of punctuation marks. But at the same time, the lack of chapters made me really reluctant to put the book down in the middle of a part. There was a part of me that thought, oh no, if I put it down during the scene break, when I pick it back up, I won't know where I was and I won't be able to reorient myself. So I found myself sometimes reading longer than I planned to because I was trying to get to the next part because there was this weird qualm I felt about stopping in a scene break. But a bigger issue for me was how this book was paced. The first 100 pages is setting things up, everyone getting into place, lots of farewells, lots of groups being formed, and then finally they set off on their two separate missions. I remember thinking to myself, you know, 100 pages, but this is over 400 pages, so I'm sure it will pick up after that. And the book didn't really pick up the pace for me once people went their separate ways. So much of Han and Leia's mission is, things don't feel right, why don't things feel right here? And at the same time, their mission doesn't feel very important to the culmination of this series. It more felt like wrapping up loose ends from those 90s eras books. Which was fun to read and fun to learn what happened to some of these bogey bad guys we've met along the way. But it also didn't feel like it was contributing a lot to the Galactic Alliance's war effort at all. And then Luke and the Jedi team are in search of Zonama Seacoat, but at the end of book one they are just now leaving for the Unknown Regions. I think that them going to the Imperial Remnant was really important. We got to see the Imperials under attack by the Yuuzhan Vong, the Imperials saw how mistaken their isolationist strategies have been for the past 12 books. And it opens up the possibility for more cooperation between the Galactic Alliance and the Empire going forward. But at the same time, it felt like a side story to the main story of uncovering the location of Zonama Seacoat. When they stumble upon the Empire under attack, there's no progress made with the search for Zonama Seacoat until the end when Palaine says, I've assigned you this historian and she knows all these stories and that's it. So this struck me a little different from Han and Leia's plot where what was happening was important, it just didn't always feel like it related to what we've been told the overarching plot is. So in short, as Remnant ends, Han and Leia and co are headed off towards Bakura thanks to information from the mysterious Rin. Luke and the other Jedi are headed into the Unknown Regions, hopefully to talk to the Chiss. And Naminor has remade himself to ingratiate himself further into the Jedi heresy. I thought the journey that all our different characters was on was interesting, I just questioned the structure that Williams and Dix use because it felt awkward at times for me to read, and I also struggled a bit with the slow pace of this story. But in interviews, Williams and Dix have said that Refugee was their favorite of the books to write, so I'm looking forward to book number two and I'm hoping that it really takes things up a notch. So next time I'm going to be reading a short comic from Star Wars Tales number 21 featuring Kyle Katarn and Jan Ors, Equals and Opposites by Nathan P. Butler and James Rays.